Hi everyone, I'm Leah, your lead course instructor here at Advanced eClinical Training, and welcome back to our lecture series. Uh, today we are going to go over your responsibilities um, during the adult assessment. All right, so during the adult assessment, um, some intake tasks uh, tasks that are going to be more common duties for you um, while working alongside the provider, such as the physician's assistant or the nurse practitioner or the doctor, um, may include checking vital signs, um, you know, such as their blood pressure, temperature, heart rate, um, performing tasks such as um, measuring height and weight. Um, also, a big part of your responsibility during the adult assessment will be to record different things, such as the chief complaint, um, their past medical history, uh, their documenting their current medical conditions, their medications, their allergies, and then also documenting any type of family history of diseases and also their social history. So uh, caring for patients who need um, help with mobility um, will be a, another task. So uh, this might be helping an elderly person to, you know, from the waiting area back to the exam room and maybe helping them up onto the exam table, um, helping them um, onto the scale. Uh, so a big part of that uh, responsibility will rely on you. And then also you will be assisting the provider with the actual physical exam. You won't be doing a physical exam. That is the provider's um, responsibility, but you will be assisting the provider with the physical exam. So first and foremost, the chief complaint. So, <clears throat> so the chief complaint can be described as a concise statement describing the symptoms the problem, condition, diagnosis, or other um, factors or reasons um, why that patient is there today in the office. So, um, and you want to try to document the chief complaint in uh, the, uh, the patient's own words. So, <clears throat> that will be a brief statement um, of their primary condition or their primary concern, and it might include something like, in quotation marks, um, I've had a productive cough for the past three weeks. That might be something um, that a patient would say. You want to document that as their chief complaint, if that's in fact what it is, if that's the reason why they are there. Um, they might say, I'm here for my annual physical. Well, then you want to document that in quotation marks as the chief complaint. All right, so moving on to past medical history. So documenting a patient's past medical history during the assessment is very, very important because um, this is going to give the provider a very good idea um, of how they can help, you know, assist with a diagnosing and treating the patient now. So a past medical history for a patient might include you know, chronic health conditions such as high blood pressure or diabetes, or they have a history of cancer. All of those things are very important to document. Also, you want to document any allergies they have. New allergies, current allergies, allergies in the past. Um, any childhood diseases. So, you know, um, if this person had uh, chicken pox as a child, or if this uh, patient had um, tuberculosis as a child. So you want to document those, those past childhood uh, diseases as well. So any vaccinations that they have, that are they have now or they're current with, um, a good rule of thumb is to always ask patients, especially during flu, during flu season, which usually runs from um, September until March, you know, have you had your flu vaccine? Are you updated with your flu vaccine? Another one, of course, is the COVID vaccine. Um, are you up to date with your COVID vaccine? Um, and you want to document all of that. Also, vaccines such as shingles, the pneumonia vaccine as well. Um, any surgical procedures? So has this patient had any 
surgery in the past. It could have been for any type of, you know, traumatic event, such as a, a fall on a broken hip and they required surgery for a new hip, or um, they have their appendix removed, or they have their gallbladder removed. So any past surgical um, procedures they had, you want to document. Any injuries to the body. So again, so um, if the patient fell, at one point they had a broken hip or if they were in a car accident and they had a, a broken arm or a broken nose. Um, so any type of injury to the body, any burns. Um, and then of course, any current medical, um, any current medications, including any over-the-counter medications such as Tylenol, ibuprofen, um, aspirin is a big over-the-counter medication that a lot of people take and that, uh, uh, doesn't often get documented any vitamins and then of course any oral contraceptives as well All right, so moving on to family medical history, so I Think sometimes students want to know why is a family medical history important if we're talking about a, pa a specific patient well family uh, history will include any health status of siblings parents and grandparents. And, and this is important because many diseases um, are hereditary and are passed down from parent to child. So, and then there are other conditions or other diseases that are familial and can occur within a particular family. Um, and so information about hereditary and familial medical issues will help, again, the provider to better diagnose and treat the patients. So, um, it's also important to note that if a if the patient's parent is deceased, you will want to note the age and the cause of death as well um, for this family medical history. So, just in just to give you a little bit of an example, so um, a lot of times heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, kidney disease. Um, these are all things that um, can be within a family. So uh, things that are could be like a familiar, familial disease. Things, genetic disorders such as sickle cell anemia. And I just talked about that actually in our webinar here in October. Um, sickle cell anemia is a genetic disorder that's passed down from parent to child. So, you know, we're gonna wanna know for sure um, if this if this patient, if their mom or their dad had sickle cell or they had another type of um, hereditary disease or disorder. All right, so personal and social history. This is, these are uh, just as important as um, going over the chief complaint and um, also the past medical history. So personal and social history. So you want to identify habits of lifestyle and patterns such as sleeping patterns. So um, how many hours on um, how many hours on average are they sleeping a night? Do they have a difficult time falling asleep? Do they have a difficult time waking up? Um, you want to document their exercise habits. Are they um, how active are they? Are they sedentary or are they um, working out five days a week or are they, um, you know, moderately working out? Also, you want to document any activities or hobbies. Um, definitely nutrition and eating habits. Um, are they eating heart healthy? Are they eating low sodium? Are they following their uh, low carb diabetic diet? Are they on a regular diet? Very important to know. Also, you want to document any alcohol use. Um, including frequency, amount, and type. So um, this sometimes can be a little bit of an awkward question to ask um, our patients, but it's, you know, really important. And I usually just slide it in there with the eating habits or also you could slide it in with, are you a smoker? Because you want to uh, document if they are a smoker. So what are they smoking and how long have they been smoking and how much are they smoking? And then I usually ask any alcohol use for you. And that's where you can document their alcohol use, how frequent and how um, and how much. And another thing about alcohol use is you want to note the type of alcohol that they are typically drinking. Is it vodka? Is it beer? Or is it wine? Um, you also want to ask about any um, illicit drug use. Um, 
And this is <clears throat> illegal drugs, but also improperly used prescription medications as well. <clears throat> So I want to ask the patient about their marital status. Are they married, single, or are they divorced? You know, what is the nature of their family relationships? What's the nature of their support system? Do they have a support system? Um, that's important to know. Also, any type of socioeconomic status, such as their source of income. Um, are they retired? Do, are they still working full-time? Are they working part-time? Um, are they receiving... Um, <clears throat> Social Security benefits. So we want to get a good idea about their socioeconomic status because that is um, definite play, definitely plays a role in their overall health status. Um, also talk about their living arrangements. Do they live alone? Um, what is their housing like? Are they all on one floor? Do they have many stairs to get up? If they're in a wheelchair, are they? Is it wheelchair accessible? Is their home wheelchair accessible? That's important to know. Um, you want to ask about, you know, any type of safety issues. Like, have you had any falls recently? Um, important to know. We kind of already went over the occupation, you know. But if they are working, what are the working conditions? Do they work in a, a plant or a mill where it's very loud, or they're exposed to? dust and chemicals? Um, are they exposed to a lot of stress? Are they in a high stress position? Um, very important to know. And then also what are their cultural and religious beliefs? Because um, that will definitely affect how we are caring for the patient and what is acceptable for them while we're caring for the patient. But also, um, religion plays a, a big role in a lot of people's lives and how they um, deal with their health and their well, their health and their wellness, and also their, their illness as well. So that's very important to understand. All right, so we did talk about vital signs, and I'm gonna go ahead and move me up here <laughs> so you guys can see. Um, so you can see this uh, graph here. So the adult assessment, like I said in the beginning, you're going to be documenting vital signs. You'll be doing vital signs before you you know document anything else probably, and you want to obtain you know their their blood pressure their uh, temperature, their pulse, and then their respiration rate. Some uh, doctors and facilities will have you also document a pulse oximetry as well. Um, so just keep in mind, and of course, we know by now that vital signs are crucial for assessing general health and is also used to help um, indicate illness and also to monitor effectiveness of treatment. So. Of course, you'll need your thermometer, you'll need a stethoscope, you'll need a blood pressure cuff, and a stopwatch or a timing device so you can measure respirations. So here you can see um, what a normal temperature is for an adult, what a normal respiration rate is for adult, um, a normal pulse that is for adult, an adult, and as well as a normal blood pressure for an adult. All right. So measuring weight. So like I said, you will also most likely always be taking a weight on a patient when they come in to the office or the facility. So knowing a patient's um, height or their weight, and I apologize, we're going to start with height here. So knowing a person's height is very important. Um, to, it's a, a very important observation to make about their overall health. So um, you wanna use what's called a stadiometer, and this is um, an essential piece of equipment that most medical practices and facilities, and I probably all seen one by now, you know, when you stand on the scale, it goes up behind you. So you wanna have the patient sit or stand on the scale, tell the patients to stand erect. Then you wanna raise the measuring bar until it touches the top of the head, extend the horizontal bar, and then lower the bar until it touches the top of the patient's head. So then that'll help you read the patient's height. So if you click on this link here, you can watch this video um, on how to do that exactly. 
visually. That'll give you a better idea. And now on to a weight. I was ahead of myself there before, but here we are with weight. So we'll also be measuring a weight on every um, encounter with a patient. Um, of course, accurate body weight is, you know, very important for the physical assessment and um, overall physical health. So when selecting the equipment, it's important to consider the patient's clinical condition and mobility. So there are different types of scales and um, that are available um, <clears throat> to use, including standing scales, chair scales, wheelchair scales, hoist scales, and bed scales. So depending on what type of facility you're working in, um, you know, if you're working in a, in a doctor's office, it's very unlikely that they're going to have a bed scale. But all hospitals now have a scale on those hospital beds already. So um, if the patient is unable to stand, you'll be using the bed scale. So again, it's very important to understand um, and determine, you know, what the patient's clinical condition is and their mobility. But um, you always want to ask the patient to remove any heavy clothing or shoes. Um, you want to make sure that the scale, any scale that you're using, is set to zero and is reset if required before weighing the patient, um, as this will help to ensure an accurate reading. Also, um, if required, you want to help the patient onto the scale and ask them to remain as still as possible with their feet off of the floor if using a sitting scale. So um, very important and if, they aren't, if you're weighing a patient in a sitting scale, make sure you ask them to um, bring their feet up off of the floor. Um, and then and again, here is a video for you to watch if you click on that link so you are able to see how to accurately measure a patient. So assisting with the physical exam. So again, the uh, medical assistant may assist the provider while performing the physical exam. And so while what you'll be responsible for during this time is handling, uh, handing the proper instruments and supplies to the provider, um, disinfecting and sanitizing the instruments and preparing them for uh, the next physical exam. Also assisting the patient to the appropriate position for the provider onto the exam table. Um, <clears throat> also assisting in collecting and properly labeling any specimens such as a urine sample, a pap smear specimen, or a throat culture. Um, and then also um, conducting any follow-up diagnostic procedures as ordered. So this might include an EKG or an eye or ear screening or a urine analysis or phlebotomy, you know, drawing blood. So whatever the doctor is asking you to do, as long as it's within your scope of practice. Always remember that. Um, and then, of course, scheduling any post-examination procedures um, that the doctor has ordered after the physical exam, such as a mammogram or an x-ray or a colonoscopy. All right, so I'm just going to show you a couple of pictures of some um, common uh tools that you might be seeing or using to help assist with the physical exam. So first we have the audioscope here, and this tool is used to screen patients for hearing loss. Um, we have the nasal speculum, and of course this tool is inserted into the nostril to assist the provider with visualizing and assessing the lining of the nose and nasal membranes. Moving on, here we have the otoscope, and this allows the provider to view the ear canal and the tympanic, uh, tympanic membrane. Uh, so the, auto, the otoscope has a magnifying lens and a light and a cone-shaped uh, <clears throat> insert to examine the inner ear. We have a tuning fork. 
So this tool is used to test a patient's hearing. So the provider will strike the prongs using them to vibrate, I'm sorry, causing them to vibrate and um, it will produce a humming sound. So the prongs are then placed next to the patient's skull near the ear and then the patient indicates when they stop hearing the humming. So this, um, the, so then the physician or the provider may order additional tests um, hearing tests, depending on the results of this uh, test using the tuning fork. All right, so the percussion hammer, this tool is used to test neurologic reflexes. So the head of the instrument is used to test reflexes by striking the tendons of the ankle, the knee, the wrist, and the elbow. Um, of course, we have the, the sphygmometer, and this is used to measure a patient's blood pressure. And um, I think we've all seen this in the vital signs um, lesson, but um, so this is composed of an inflatable rubber, rubber cuff, a ball that inflates and then releases pressure from the cuff, and um, you use the stethoscope to listen to the arterial blood flow of the patient, and that will give you the, an accurate uh, blood pressure reading. So the physical assessment. <clears throat> so this is more, uh, the next few slides are just more for your information. You're not, you don't need to necessarily memorize this, but um, for testing purposes, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention to make you aware. So when you do begin working in the field, it's not uh, foreign to you how the doctor will conduct the physical assessment. So the examination will begin um, obviously with the patient on the table and the provider will examine the patient in an orderly and methodic sequence. So first the viewing the patient's head and neck, then examining their eyes and ears and their nose and their sinuses, their mouth and throat, onto the chest, the breast, and the abdomen, and then the legs. And then lastly, the provider will check the patient's reflexes. So this again, these next few slides, you don't necessarily need to know this for the exam, but I just wanted to share this information with you um, so you know you were familiar with it when you begin working in the field. So just the review of the systems. As I said, the provider will start with the head. They want to look at their skull, their scalp, their hair and face. They're all inspect, you know, uh, assessed for size, shape, and symmetry. Uh, the provider will also look for any nodules, masses, or any kind of trauma, and he'll assess for any headaches, dizziness, syncope, which is uh, passing out, or any head injuries. And then the provider will assess any um, fibrous tissues covering the eye for normal coloring. The pupils are assessed with a pen light to view, to, um, view their size and see if they react normally to light. Um, the patient will then follow the provider's finger to examine proper eye movement. The ears are assessed for size and symmetry, lesions, nodules. And then this is when the provider will use the otoscope to examine the interior of the ear. And any auditory acuity is tested at this time with the tuning fork or the audioscope that we just had a look at. And you can um, click on this link here and this will take you to a um, a video that will show you actually um, how a provider uses the tuning fork to assess for um, hearing in a patient. So moving on to the review of systems, nose and sinuses. Um, so the nose is examined for any abnormalities um, using the nasal speculum and pen lights. Um, the doctor will assess for, you know, sense of smell, frequency of colds, um, any epitaxis, which are nosebleeds, any post-nasal post discharge or sinus pain. Also, he'll be looking at, he or she will be looking at the patient's mouth and throat, looking at their mucous membranes and their gums and their teeth and their tongue and their tonsils and their throat, looking for any abnorm abnormalities of color, ulcerations, nodules, um, And then moving on to chest 
breasts and abdomen. So the provider will look for any obvious masses or swelling. Um, with the stethoscope, the provider will listen for any abnormal sounds in the lungs um, and the heart. They'll listen to the apical pulse, and that apical pulse is done um, here on the left side underneath um, uh, in, in the intercostal space here um, while the patient takes deep breaths. So then the breasts of the male and the female patients will be examined for any abnormalities or masses. The abdomen is assessed for contour, symmetry, and movement from the aorta because as we've learned, uh, the aorta does um, move, is all the way down into the abdomen. So the provider will also use the stethoscope to listen for bowel sounds. And lastly, the provider will examine the abdomen organs for any enlargement, masses, pain, or tenderness. And then, of course, lastly, the legs um, are assessed for any abnormalities. Uh, the doctor or the provider, I should say, would check for pulses um, and post-tibial pulses or femoral pulses. Um, and then the measure the extremity of blood flow. So um, the legs will also be assessed for any varicose veins. And then lastly, the provider will check reflexes with the percussion hammer that we saw a few slides back. And here is a video that you can access and you can see how the provider actually does the um, check for the reflexes. And again, these next three slides, um, you don't need to memorize any of this for the exam. And this is not anything you will be doing, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention again. So when you are assisting a provider with a, an adult assessment, especially the physical assessment part, um, this isn't going to be so unfamiliar to you. So there are methods of examination that the doctor will use while conducting the physical assessment. First is inspection, and of course, this just begins with, you know, looking at the patient, looking um, at their overall uh, body and their behavior. So in, this will come with knowledge and experience, but the provider will become highly attuned and highly sensitive to any visual cues that are out of the norm. And then they'll use a method of examination called percussion. So by setting underlying tissues in motion, percussion helps in determining the density of the underlying tissue and whether it is air-filled, fluid-filled, or solid. So audible sounds and palpable vib vibrations are produced, which can be distinguished by the provider. And um, the five basic notes produced by percussion can be distinguished by differences in the qualities of the sound, pitch, duration, and intensity. So again, this isn't something you need to know, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention so you, when you're with the provider and you see them doing these things that it's not so unfamiliar to you. Uh, moving on with the methods of examination, of course, we have auscultation. So this method is used with the stethoscope um, and that's um, the stethoscope. stethoscope is used to increase the sense of hearing. So with the stethoscope, ear pieces should be comfortable. The length of the tubing should be 10 to 15 inches and the head should have a diaphragm and a bell. And the bell part of the stethoscope is used for um, a low, pit, low pitch sound, such as certain heart murmurs and the diaphragm screens out low pitch sounds and is good for hearing high frequency sounds such as breath sounds. So if the doctor is um, um, assessing lung, their lungs, they will use um, this part of the stethoscope, the diaphragm. And then there's palpation. The provider will touch the body part or region of the body and note whether it is tender to touch in addition to what the various structures feel like. So um, it is performed in an organized manner from region to region. And again, the provider with experience comes the, the ability to determine any variation from normal. So lastly, once the provider ends the exam, 
Part of your responsibility is then, of course, to perform any follow-up treatments and procedures as ordered by the provider, um, such as, you know, the administration of vaccines or maybe performing an EKG or collecting blood work. Um, and then, um, you know, once you finish with that, you'll ask the patient to redress and wait for further instructions. Um, once the patient is dressed, you can escort the patient to uh, the front desk where they can schedule follow-up appointments or testing that has been ordered by the provider that can't be completed in the office. And then lastly, um, you want to uh, dispose of any disposable supplies and equipment used during the physical examination and the assessment, and then prepare the room for the next patient. So that is the end here of the adult assessment. Um, <clears throat> of course, if you um, have any questions or concerns about it, anything or you need clarification, you know that you can always email me. I have an open door policy, so I'm available to you um, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to around 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and then on the weekends, um, a little bit more infrequent. But um, again, if you need any clarification, please do reach out to me. But thanks uh, for joining us, and I'll see you all again real soon.